The Old Testament lesson for today is taken from the book of Genesis, chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. Page 3, Pew Bible. Cain murdered his brother Abel because Abel's righteousness confronted Cain's guilty conscience. Genesis 4, 1. Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, With the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out to the field. And, there, and while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Re replied Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. The New Testament lesson is taken from the book of 1 John, chapter 3, verses 11 through 20, page 863. Hatred makes us murderers, which disqualifies one from eternal life. Love overcomes hatred and is shown by Jesus laying down his life for us, and we in turn doing the same for others. 1 John 3.11 This is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. This, then, is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. Whenever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Uh, the gospel lesson is taken from the book of Matthew. Would you please rise for the hearing of... The last gospel, Matthew 5, 21 through 26, page 684. Keeping the commandment to, do, to not murder includes harboring no evil thought nor speaking evil words against our neighbors. Matthew 5, 21. You have heard that it is said to the people long ago, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka is answerable to the Sahedron, but anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you, are an offering, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still with him on the way or he may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. I tell you the truth, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. Here ends the readings of the lessons. You may be seated. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20, give the background for the rest of the sermon. 
Our righteousness must exceed that of the Pharisees, Jesus said, in order for us to even enter the kingdom of heaven. And our righteousness ultimately comes from God. And our righteousness must be an inner righteousness of the heart and of the mind, as well as in word and deed. And in the rest of chapter 5, Jesus gives six examples from the law as illustrations. Jesus tells us first what the law says, and then he correctly interprets it for us. The Pharisees, of course, they had their own interpretations, and they had many little laws that, to explain the main laws. But Jesus interpreted it correctly. He didn't give a new law, as they suggested, as they accused him of, but uh, gave the, uh, God's interpretation of it, what it really means. Uh, Jesus, unlike the Pharisees, Pharisees' um, explanations or interpretation was purely external. In other words, if you did it in your body, you kept the commandment. Jesus began with the commandment, do not murder. Well, I, th I remembered, uh, as Sherry was telling the story about the little boy in the boat, how many of you ever made a little boat, you know, when you were a little boy, did you make a boat? How many of you ever read Curious George? Do you remember Curious George? The little monkey with the, and he belonged to the man in the yellow hat, and uh, he saw a little boy making paper boats. So I read that story one time. I thought, oh, I can do that. So I took some newspaper and made paper boats, and the darn thing sank, you know. <laughs> Not a very good boat maker, I guess. But I remember that, and, uh, and I kind of re related that to the, the commandment today. You do not murder. You know, I made crummy boats. They sank. But Jesus made us. You know, we were boats in the story. We're good boats. We're boats made in his image. And that's why we're not to take another's life. It's God's life to give and to take, not ours. But Jesus begins with the commandment, do not murder. And the principle in the law, murderers are subject to judgment. The Pharisees figured that so long as they didn't take anybody's life, as long as they didn't stab somebody or beat them over the head with a rock or kill them somehow, they've kept the commandment. And Jesus said, no, that's not where it's at. We may refer to Matthew 15, verse 19. In another situation, Jesus said this, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. These are what make a man unclean. This is what makes us guilty in God's eyes. What comes out of our heart? Not only the things that we do. Of course the actions are wrong. But what causes those actions? It's thoughts, it's words, it's ideas, it's improper desires in our minds. You might remember from Matthew 4, the temptation of Jesus, that temptations themselves are not sin. Sometimes when we're tempted, we feel kind of dirty. We feel like, oh my gosh, I thought this horrible thing. The temptation itself is not a sin. If you despise what was tempted, you haven't sinned. It's when we entertain that temptation, when we desire it, when we agree with it, that we begin down the pathway of sin. Jesus was tempted, yet was without sin. But temptations are the devil enticing us away from God. Life is a big battle. God wants us to go his way. Devil wants us to go his way. And temptations is the devil's tool to go away from God. It's as simple as that. So long as we dismiss and refuse the temptation, we're not sinning. As Luther said, you can't keep a bird from flying overhead, but you can keep it from building a nest in your hair. And that's particularly easy for middle-aged men like me. No hair to build a nest in. But anyway, with temptations, they come. They just happen. Kind of like grits in the south. They just come, but they don't find a welcome reception in our hearts. They don't, they're not supposed to. But when we don't dismiss the temptation, that's our first sin. When we agree with it, we sin again, and we just the ball just keeps rolling until we stop it. If we talk about it, if we plan it, if we secretly desire and work and scheme, all those are sins. And the final action of actually committing it is the last in a long line, in a long series. It's kind of hard to believe after a long and very cold winter, but pretty soon we'll be planting things in the gardens and in the fields. 
And some things that we don't plant will start growing too. We call them weeds. Now when is the easiest time to pull a weed? When they're a couple inches tall or when they're a couple feet tall? A couple inches. It's pretty easy to get rid of your weeds when they're little so long as you give it your attention. You know, run down the row with your little tiller or cultivator or a hoe or whatever you have and they're gone. But if you let those weeds get this tall, you're not going to have very much crops. Your garden has gone all to pot. It doesn't produce good fruit at all. So it is with sin. The longer we hold on to it, the longer we allow it to thrive, to live, the more size and strength it gains until it becomes very difficult to resist or overcome. And that's why it's so important to develop a heart dead set against sinning. I read a story one time about a, uh, I think it was a home ec teacher actually, or 4-H, doesn't matter, but she was uh, giving a Christian lesson to her, her students, her uh, people that were putting on a, a uh, learning how to bake, and she, she, she uh, you know how you got to go behind dogs if you live anywhere where there's people and collect the residue from the walk? And so she brought a little sample of that, and she said, now how about if I put this in with my cookie recipe? And go, ew, you know, we don't want that. Well, how about if I put just a little bit in? Well, still, nobody wanted to eat those cookies. And that's the way it is with sin. It just takes a little bit to mess up everything, mess up our whole life. It's best to avoid it altogether. Jesus said, whoever is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. It goes way beyond murder. It gets at the root of the problem. Whoever is angry with his brother. Some manuscripts, if you look in your Bible, almost all of them say, some manuscripts say, without cause. And there's reason to believe that may actually be the correct reading. We don't know for sure. We don't have any of the originals. But the problem is, is what do we, how do we interpret that without a cause? Angry without a cause. We all know there's such a thing as righteous anger. Jesus was angry. He was angry at the scribes and Pharisees who kept following him around, who wanted him to not heal somebody because it was the Sabbath day. Mark chapter 3 is one of those instances. Jesus was angry at the, fortune, at the money changers in the temple. They were guilty of extortion in the very temple grounds, robbing the people, charging too high of interest, commercializing the worship of God. And so we know there is such a thing as righteous anger. But the problem is we pretty easily convince ourselves that our anger is righteous and everybody else's is wrong. We pretty easily justify our own feelings. That we have every right to feel the way we do. To react the way we do. And most of the time, it's not usually righteous anger at all, but we have need of learning patience, of learning humility, or of learning suffering. We need also to recall, and Paul is pretty good at reminding us of things that come out of the heart as well. He said the fruit of the flesh. We all are familiar with the fruit of the Spirit. We don't concentrate much on the fruit of the flesh, and I think that's a good idea. If we want to uh, live the positive, we need to uh, uh, concentrate on those things. But he says the acts of the sinful nature, the fruit of the flesh, are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, Selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. In Ephesians 4, 31, he talks about getting rid of all anger and rage and bitterness, brawling and slander. In Colossians 3, 8, likewise, get rid of all these things, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. These are things that we need to... Work on, get rid of, use them, and particularly if they're a little problem, if they kind of begin creeping into our life. Regard them as a small weed and get rid of it, pull of it before they come a, become a big one. 
James chapter 1 says, Dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. I read of a, a story of a Christian woman one time who had a roommate. And this roommate had a temper. And every time the alarm went off, she didn't like it. And she woke up with this torrent of filthy language coming from her lips and was, you know, just on the verge of throwing the alarm clock across the room. And eventually she got out of bed. But that's the way she greeted the morning. But one day this woman got saved. She had gone to a church meeting or something and she got saved and she accepted Christ. And, and the next morning the alarm went off. This Christian woman was expecting her roommate, you know, the normal morning activity. But instead, the alarm simply got turned off. The woman got up and got herself ready for the day. No filthy language. The fruit of the Spirit gets rid of all those things. And so we need to cultivate the Holy Spirit in our hearts. To welcome Him into our hearts each day. Let the Holy Spirit fill us so that anger and rage and all these other things don't have a foothold. So that we don't produce the filthy words and the actions. That's what the Holy Spirit does, is cleanses our hearts. Going back in Matthew 5, Jesus said, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. What's Raka? It's one of those untranslated words. That was just uh, a word that was used that meant empty head, dunderhead, fool. It's, it's simply a term of utter contempt, of regarding ourselves as better than the other person, as regarding the other person as worthless. We dismiss one another with a sneer. Jesus said, anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. And the word for fool here is more, from which we get moron. In addition to being witless, this is also a description of one who is morally deficient. And remember, this is what comes out of our mouths directed at other people. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. Their deeds are vile. When we carry that attitude toward others, Jesus said, we're in line for judgment. Because we are judging others improperly. Jesus, later in the Sermon on the Mount, warns us against improper judging, saying, Judge not, lest ye be judged, because the way you judge others is the way that you will be judged. And we'll do well to remember instead that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we might tack onto that, including me. We do well to remember the prayer of the tax collector, God, have mercy on me, the sinner. We may recall that anger is usually a tantrum that we throw. You know, we, we think about the terrible twos and little kids that they don't get their way and they throw a tantrum. And anger is simply a grown-up tantrum for not getting our way, not getting the things we want, not having life go the way we want it to go. Let's remember that Jesus called us to take up our cross and follow him, to die to self and follow Jesus, even as we pray, thy will be done. And finally, Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 5 to reconcile. He gives the example of one who is offering his gift at the altar, the very heart of worship giving your gift as a symbol of giving of yourself to God. If you remember that your brother has something against you, Jesus said, go and first be reconciled and then come and offer your gift. Why? Because God can't accept your gift if you're not reconciled. We talked about the same thing with prayer last year, how if we're not right with one another, we can say anything we want to and it goes in and at one ear and out the other for God. Forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us, we pray. And in Matthew 18, 
Jesus said, when your brother sins against you, go to him. So it really doesn't make any difference who does the sinning. If we're at odds with anyone, go and be reconciled. God, Jesus describes the place we put ourselves in when we don't forgive, when we're unreconciled with, and particularly with our fellow believers, but really with anyone. Jesus describes it as a jail that we put ourselves into. I read once of a man who was going, I think he lived in Africa and he was walking, but it's beside the point. He, li- he was going someplace to a church meeting where he was to give the message. And the Lord reminded him that he had had an argument with his wife and said some very unkind things. He said, you need to go home and patch things up with your wife. And he said, Lord, I have to preach in 20 minutes. I can't, I'll, I'll do it later. I'll do it after church. And the Lord told him, that's fine. Go ahead and preach. I'll stay home with your wife. Drop what you're doing. It's so important, Jesus said, to be reconciled with one another that our worship and our prayers are useless unless we were first reconciled. If God brings it to mind, that's the time to do it. Be slow to anger and quick to forgive. Anger causes us to be murderers in God's eyes. That's what John wrote in 1 John 3 that we read. The commandment says, you shall not murder. Luther's explanation of the, in the, of the commandment says, we should fear and love God so that we should not endanger our neighbor's life nor cause him any harm, but help and befriend him in every necessity of life. 1 John three sixteen. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. The great commandment says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So if we're like the Pharisees and we want to keep God's law, We don't want to be like the Pharisees and just say, don't kill somebody. We want to love as God has first loved us. For love is the fulfilling of the law. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll sing our next hymn.